Welcome back everyone to part two as we uh, take a look at alternate history hubs. What if Germany won World War II? Overwhelming uh, positive response yesterday to part one, one of our most viewed videos that is not oversimplified in quite some time. Uh, so thank you for that and that tells me you want to see more. So we're going to work our way through what I believe. Uh, I haven't checked personally but a bunch of you told me that there was like four parts to this. So that's uh, what we're looking forward to. And at the conclusion of these four parts, uh, we are also going to be taking a look at Extra Credits, Admiral Yi, which has been a long time requested series on this channel. Uh, and then we'll see what the patrons are voting on to see what comes after that. Uh, but in the meantime, I wanted to address a couple of things from yesterday. Uh, several of you correctly pointed out, and this is something I should clarify and talk about for just a minute that while the uh, technical name of the Nazi party, Nazis, a nickname that was used uh, mostly by outside folks uh, describing the party, it was not how they described themselves. Um, though they have the word socialist in their name, by the time Hitler came to power in the 1930s and had consolidated that power, they really weren't socialists. Uh, you know, just real quick background into this. Uh, Hitler is in the aftermath of World War I. He's still working for the army, which is downsizing quite a bit. And he's sent by the army to keep an eye on what was then called the German Workers' Party. And he finds himself agreeing with a lot of what they're saying, but feeling that they aren't doing it forcefully enough or going far enough. And so he actually joins the German Workers' Party and he is part of their transformation into the, you know, what we call the Nazi Party today. Uh, so he rises to power within that organization, uh, heavily on his ability to speak and communicate their message, uh, and surrounding himself with key people like Joseph Goebbels, Heinrich Himmler, and others, uh, he rises to power. He becomes Chancellor of Germany. Uh, the president uh, basically die he dies. They consolidate the, the uh, offices of, of chancellor and president into one. By that point, uh, Hitler had already received uh, emergency dictatorial powers, which he then keeps. Uh, and then there's what's called the Night of the Long Knives, which is when Hitler gets rid of all of his enemies, including some folks within the Nazi party that had been kind of holdovers from the old uh, kind of socialist wing of that party. And so, yeah, by and large, by the time he comes to power and is transforming Germany in his image, the socialist part of Germany is really not there. So it's important that we clarify that, and several of you pointed that out. That all said, it's still not as simple as pinpointing a place on the left-right political spectrum. The Nazi party is an animal all of its own. Uh, and no, it's not centrist, it's not left, it's not right. It's just kind of authoritarian... Uh, fascism, it's kind of just its own thing. And it's really kind of silly to try and find a place on the political spectrum for such an organization. But let's go ahead and dive into part two. If you didn't see part one of my reaction, the link's in the description. And uh, the link to this part two, the original video is also there. Let's take a look. Europe has fallen to Germany. The Allies are nothing more than a footnote in history, and former Slavic lands are now breadbaskets for the Aryan race. This is part two to my series, What If Germany Won World War II? If you haven't watched part one, click here so you can catch up on the scenario. We left part one with a Europe now not only under Nazi occupation, but subjected to fascist dominance as well. In our timeline across the Western world, a counterculture movement split generations apart. In this alternate timeline, the generations are still divided, however with a cultural split between some of the older generation and their fanatical, indoctrinated children. The older generation still support the fascist states, but just not to the emotional extent that the newer, more impressionable generation does. So this is a good point. There's a difference between uh, attaching yourself to an ideology in middle age or even in old age that comes about during that time. There's a difference between that and being raised from your earliest memory, being taught that this is the way and it's the only way. Uh, it, there is a different level of fanaticism there. So it would be interesting to see how that would play out in like the 1960s with Germany's version of baby boomers. Party education teaches not only who was the enemy, but to encourage and train children to use outright violence against those deemed a threat to Germany. With each passing generation, children become more violent, fanatical, and devoted 
to an ever-secured ideology. Education becomes mandatory by the state, but the type of education would be only to solidify the racial ideology of the party, nothing else. History, science, and the humanities are taught in the perspective of the Germans against all, or to shape the mindset of the Aryan destiny. You that... I understand why he says it would be that way, and it could very well have worked out that way, but I hesitate to go to that extreme to say that the Nazi ideology would have permeated every single aspect of society that science would have been taught in that uh, through that uh, kind of lens, that history, all those things. Uh, I can see that being a part of it, but I don't know if I would go quite that far. The use of violence against undesirables and military service to the state is idealized and praised. For a man to be a true citizen of Germany, he would have to serve in the armed forces, and for a woman, to be married and bear children. To many German children, they were born into a society which actively praises them for just being born. They would have never seen any atrocities or brutality, as those methods rid the fatherland of minorities long ago. Any mention of such methods would be praised as actions of heroes and made in a legend. I will say this too, and I know it kind of seems like I'm intentionally trying to find things to disagree with because I largely agreed with everything yesterday, and that's not necessarily the case, but I'm just trying to, to think outside the box and kind of think of other possibilities here. Um, when you come to power uh, and you hold on to power through creating enemies, I feel like there's always got to be an enemy. So I don't know if there would ever come a time when you would arrive at that place where there were no more enemies. You know, this idea that, well, they, you know, this new generation growing up wouldn't see the violence and the, um, the elimination of people in camps and things like that. I feel like there would always have to be another enemy. Uh, and, and I'm assuming at this point we still have uh, folks like Japan and the United States and Africa and South America are out there. I'm, I'm guessing the Nazi ideology would have come up with another enemy to pursue. Except for the true extent and methods of the Holocaust, which is a closely guarded secret. Throughout this series, I'm sure you've been wondering, wouldn't people eventually revolt against the fascists? Wouldn't they see the oppressive policies and unite against the puppet states and even in Nazi Germany against Hitler himself? How would such a reality even become a reality? simply from a military victory. The Nazi victory in fascist states they propped up all easily could have fell into disorder, or at least civil war, even if Germany won World War II. Nazism in our timeline was a quick experiment. It burnt hot, but quickly was snuffed out. We can never truly know how Nazis would hold on to their great empire yeah. if they achieved military victory. This scenario was simply the best case scenario for the Nazis, considering they don't botch the odds against themselves. If things did not go perfectly for the Nazis, they would deal with full-out insurrection, rebellion, and civil war in occupied territories, and perhaps even fighting amongst Nazis inside the party in Germany itself. And you know, we have examples of extreme ideologies hanging on to power for long periods of time. Uh, so it's not like it wouldn't have been possible. But I still feel like there'd be enough enemies out there that eventually, you know, if, if Britain, for example, started to rebel, I could see the United States coming along and supporting that and helping it happen. So it's not like they would be doing that by themselves. All which would certainly harm the stability of the Third Reich. If Nazism was to survive and keep its hold on Europe, it would need to deeply ingrain itself in the hearts and minds of the conquered. Military victories would certainly give credit to the government, but two other factors are just as important. Economic stability and the infallibility of the leader. Mm -hmm. In this alternate scenario, if the Nazi economic model held up, created jobs, and allowed good standards of living in the first decade after the war, Europeans would not only accept the new status of German domination, but actively support the fascist governments set up in place. Totally agree with that, and that's a big part of why the Nazis came to power in the first place. It was the economic instability in Germany. It was the absolute devastation of the German economy. And when people are desperate, they will look to anyone that they think might have an answer to that. And in this case, they looked to the, to the Nazis. Now, they didn't necessarily, right off the bat, a lot of them did agree with the Nazi ideology. A lot of them did have that hatred toward Jews, toward Bolsheviks, toward others. I'm not saying that didn't exist, but I think a lot of the people who voted 
the Nazis into power in 1932, 33, uh, they were just looking for answers to their crumbling, their crumbled economy. They were looking to someone who could fix things. And so, yeah, as long as the economy's doing well, there are jobs and things feel relatively stable. Absolutely. And some of you also correctly pointed out that this is an ideology that is built heavily around the persona of Adolf Hitler. At some point, Hitler's going to die. He can't live forever. And we could see toward the end of his life, he was look, probably suffering from Parkinson's. Uh, and I've seen that in my own family, what Parkinson's has done to my grandmother. So I know how devastating that disease can be. Um, so it would probably depend a lot on who the successor was and whether or not they could hang on to that kind of cult of personality um, and, and keep people supporting it, even with Hitler gone. It would legitimize fascism as a new theory to govern by, like monarchy, democracy, or socialism. Nazism is practically a cult, one that takes the word of the fewer, Adolf Hitler is law. If Hitler or a new leader somehow lost credibility within the early years of the Reich, the system would be at risk of being weakened. As the decades move on, this becomes less of a risk as Nazism forms a solid bedrock foundation through myth and legend. The best comparison is with the founding fathers to the United States. Violence is used across fascist Europe against political opponents and critics, silencing any immediate threats by gunpoint or deportation. This decreases the threat of rebellion as political critics are killed off with frightening efficiency. What would life be like for the average German inside the Third Reich? In our timeline, the Western world sees a capitalist and consumerist lifestyle. In North Korea, the state rules everything. In Australia, emus and dingoes wage brutal genocide against the populace. What? <laughs> so, um, yeah, fair point. Uh, as we're thinking about the threat of insurrection from inside, look at, now granted it was only five years, but look at Europe under Nazi occupation. Yes, there were significant underground movements in places like France and Poland uh, and many of the other occupied territories as well, but none of them on their own were able to do anything substantial to change the occupation. Uh, they were only able to work in concert with invasions from the Soviets, from the Western Allies. Uh, so apart from an outside force coming in, these insurrections, these undergrounds, these uh, kind of things that are happening from within aren't going to be enough to change the outcome. What could we expect in an alternate Nazi Germany society? It's difficult to assume how a short experiment like the Confederate States could have survived without the North. It would be just as difficult to assume the peacetime economic policies of the Third Reich, say a decade or two after the war. Like I said, Nazism was a movement which burned hot and went out fast. Its creation and sustainability in our timeline depended on having an enemy to fight. This isn't to say it would collapse, but it certainly would have to adapt to a continent without enemies. Nazism didn't place economics as a crucially important thing. Hitler saw economic policy as simply a way to fuel the eventual war effort and sustain it. That said, I think even Hitler understood that he was looking toward a time where there wouldn't be war. He did make those kinds of plans. And he had people, as I mentioned yesterday, like, like Albert Speer, who uh, were helping him to kind of lay the foundations for this greater German Reich that they thought would exist at some point. So I don't entirely agree that it was completely all about war all the time. I think at some point Hitler did see war as a means to an end. A secondary factor to building the army and achieving Lebensraum. It's hard to predict how the Third Reich could handle its own economy after the war and after the Russians were destroyed. Nazism was a product of its time. Predicting its economy would be comparable to predicting how the United States would run its internal affairs today based off how the economy was conducted in 1920. Mm. We wouldn't see crucial factors which propped up and changed the course. So predicting how Hitler could have dealt with, say, an economic crash or an oil crisis would not be entirely accurate. I can't go into much detail about how the German economy would be after the war, but I can say a brief generalization. I believe that the Reich would organize its economy simply off of Lebensraum. Every part of the German society, the economy, government, and people itself was simply to wipe out the enemies of the Reich. 
not just to wipe out the enemies of Reich, the Reich, but once you've cleared that space in places like Ukraine and Western Russia and Poland and, and the places where they were planning to expand, now you can have massive new building projects. You're going to build new cities. You're going to build new uh, r entire regions built around this new Lebensraum that you have, living space. Once Lebensraum was achieved, I believe in this alternate timeline, the Nazi party would reorganize the economy away from the war effort and focus its economy on what best suits maintaining the land it conquered. Standard of living can fall, production of goods can fall, starvation could occur, but the Nazis would never allow one inch of land to fall into the hands of the enemy. The Reich never trades with nations outside its realm of influence. This isn't much of a problem considering the Reich has influence over the British, French, and Italians for resources. Raw materials are harnessed through slave labor in the Russian colonies. I don't entirely agree that the German Reich would not be willing to trade with people outside its sphere of influence. I could see them trading with uh, Japan and the United States and South America. I mean, there were some pretty decent ties between Germany and parts of South America, particularly Argentina. So I don't know if I agree with that. The German people could see a society of great wealth and prosperity, or one of poverty and rations. No matter what in this alternate timeline, their fate would depend on the military expeditions of the Reich. Society would accept that above all else, territory is what truly matters, above individual fulfillment. In our timeline, one thing that stands out about Nazi Germany, apart from the brutal conquest and genocidal nature, was the advances the Germans made in military technology. How would this have progressed if the Third Reich had not collapsed? Eugenics, social Darwinism, and genealogy were all popular across the Western world at the time, but used by the calculating Nazis to legitimize their objectives for the Aryan race. And I should mention too, and there was a few people commenting on this, uh, yes, there, uh, the idea of eugenics had a rebirth in the 1800s, particularly starting in the United States, and that was something that Hitler was aware of and influenced by. But the idea of eugenics, the idea of kind of social breeding, uh, you know, kind of social engineering and breeding to kind of get the best possible, goes all the way back to ancient Greece. This was not a new concept by any stretch of the imagination. These were not new ideas created by Hitler, but they were areas of academia that the Nazis harnessed for their own ideology. In our timeline, Nazism made eugenics and social Darwinism unpopular, but had they won the war, research and the ideas would have become far more popular across Europe and the globe. Inhuman experiments on Untermatch still continue in this alternate timeline, sponsored by the government. Scientific advancement is determined by politics. In our timeline, half of Germans in university were studying medicine. Genetics and medical studies were preferred by the state to maintain a healthy and efficient Aryan race. Women would be discouraged from pursuing education or careers that were not beneficial to producing children. Technology is only advanced that is positive to the state. Tech that is threatening to the Reich is discouraged to be continued. Communication like cell phones, the internet, and other forms of communication easy to spread ideas are killed in development. Again, I don't know that I necessarily agree with that. I feel like with some of these ideas, he's going really extreme. Now, I get it. The Nazis were an extreme party. I mean, so I, I understand that. But, you know, it feels like this is focusing really, really super heavy on the militarism of the Nazi party. Uh, and it, it, I feel like he just can't get out of the mindset of war and military because that's where the Nazi experiment ended. So we don't we don't know what it would have looked like in a peacetime scenario and i don't know i don't know if i agree with this about things like cell phones being killed because they would have been ways to communicate never made available to the masses generations of lawyers scholars scientists and engineers grow up fed the propaganda of the state. If Nazi plans were successful, the intellectuals of Nazi Germany hold an extremely violent ideology close to heart. If communication is advanced, it will only be in the control of the state. Technology which makes the exchange of ideas easier would be heavily restricted by the Reich. Television and radio are left under the control of the regime. With the German economy dedicated to the military, weapon technology advances much faster than in our timeline. In this alternate timeline, a continent-wide empire uses most of its resources to get an advantage over its enemies. Moving on, in this alternate timeline across the continent, fascism wouldn't be one universal cookie-cut ideology. 
each nation would adapt fascist beliefs to their national identity. For example, France, Italy, and Spain would boast Catholicism as their national religion. To make fascism more acceptable, it would be associated with already existing ideas. In our timeline, Vichy France created laws which were to reverse the effects of the liberal French Revolution. In the and this is all... These are all excellent points. Fascism is not a cookie cutter thing. It looked different in Japan than it did in Germany. It looked different in Germany than it did in Italy, for example. Uh, so, yeah, I agree. I mean, it's all heavily influenced by Germany. A, a good comparison would be to look at communism in the Soviet Union versus communism uh, in their satellite states. It, it was certainly influenced by and heavily um, kind of overseen by, but it didn't look exactly the same. In this alternate scenario, this is the universal theme across Nazi-influenced Europe, as liberal and enlightenment beliefs are slowly strangled. In France, the government creates a more conservative, authoritarian, and Catholic state. This is different than the Nazis, as Hitler aimed to reinvent German society. The Vichy French simply used the existing conservative elements of French society. Nazi persecution of Catholics in their eastern territories creates tension between the French and Germans, but faced with the overwhelming threat of force, the Vichy French would voice little public opinion about it and do little action against it. In our timeline, the Nazis held French prisoners of war as practical hostages in labor camps. I believe in this alternate scenario, the same tactics would be used to make sure the populace and governments would not react against German puppet masters. Britain and its empire become the apple in the eye for the Germans. In this alternate timeline, Britain has lost the air battle with the Luftwaffe, and German troops successfully invaded and occupied the island nation. The royal family fled to Canada, but the remaining remnants of the British government are dissolved, replaced with a temporary military government. So, and you know, again, I know this isn't really what we're talking about, because we're not talking about how Germany would have won World War II. We're talking about what it looks like if Germany won World War II. But uh, it seems like he focuses heavily on, well, Germany won the air war, therefore they invaded. But there's still the Royal Navy to be dealt with. I still have a hard time believing that the air war alone would have been enough for Germany to be able to put through Operation Sea Lion, which was their planned invasion of the British mainland. Uh, but that's not what we're talking about. After the invasion, the occupying Germans treat the British kindly, even going so far to pay for goods and services. The plan was to ease the occupied British into accepting the new government, disband any fear from the stories of Poland and Russia, it would be a campaign of kindness. However, after months of kindness, the Germans would secretly implement purges against any political and social groups seen as a threat to the Reich. After occupying Britain for an unspecified amount of time, the Nazis would allow a puppet British government to operate once again. This is also needed to maintain the global empire that stretched across Africa and Asia. Switzerland would have eventually fell. Hitler absolutely despised the Swiss and would have invaded had the war in Russia not gone so terribly. In those so yeah, that's an interesting thing. People don't talk a lot about what was going on in Switzerland during all this time because Switzerland is neutral. Uh, you know, Spain largely stays out of what's happening in Europe uh, with the war. Uh, so I'm interested to see what he says about this. Alternate timeline, if Hitler was able to win the war on both fronts, Switzerland is invaded and dissolved. Alternate timeline, I believe the relationship between Nazi Germany and Italy would have gotten far worse. I mentioned in part one how Hitler's views on race created tension between him and Benito Mussolini, but this wasn't the only issue between the two. In our timeline, the relationship between Italy and Germany was one of convenience and military protection. The war pact was one that would last only 10 years. That was it. While Italy under Mussolini talked a big game, it simply did not have the resources or industrialization that Germany did to reclaim the Roman Empire. Mussolini even told Hitler that Italy would not be ready for a war, at least until 1942, upon which Hitler ignored and invaded Poland, dragging- Now what, what Mussolini did have was a pretty strong navy. Uh, people forget how big Italy's navy was in the Mediterranean uh, during World War II. One of the biggest navies in that part of the world. Um, but yeah, they just didn't have the industrial capability. Uh, they didn't have the manpower, the resources to do what Germany was doing. And, and they fell pretty quick once they were invaded in 1943. And the Italians along with him. Modern Italy was simply not built for fighting. As the conflict raged on, the Italian armies failed to capture North Africa and the Balkans. Relations between the two deteriorated. I predict the relationship going down two possible paths. One, 
After the defeat of the Russians and no real enemy on the horizon, the Italians simply become too much of a burden and Nazi Germany invades their former ally. Northern Italy is assimilated into the Reich. Southern Italy is devolved into a poor outer state. I don't think it would have come to that, personally. I don't think they would have invaded Italy. I could see them helping to overthrow Mussolini if he's no longer convenient for them. I can see them heavily influencing things, maybe even sending troops in to help maintain order and things like that, but I don't know a full out of invasion would have happened. The Italians are unable to put up much of a resistance against the massive, powerful German war machine. Second, if the relationship remained stable and Germany did not invade, the Nazis would have loomed over Italy for decades. Mussolini's Italian Empire is nothing more than a puppet to the Nazi Reich. Yeah. Italy could hold territory in the Balkans, Mediterranean, and North Africa. However, it is dependent on Germany to maintain control over them. In the immediate aftermath of Nazi victory, thousands die from government neglect, rape, and reprisals for uprisings against the occupiers. Even in states like Greece, Yugoslavia, and other regions not set for depopulation like in Russia, Europe's map is redrawn to include regimes only loyal to the Axis. Yeah. Greece is renamed to the Hellenic Republic, Yugoslavia is disbanded and split among the independent state of Croatia, Albania, and Italy. Yeah, so I mean that makes sense with Yugoslavia if you don't think you can control it, split it back into the parts that it is today. Uh, you know, it broke up in the 1990s, I think it was, and it's easier to control when there are a bunch of smaller warring states that don't like each other and have different ideologies and different nationalities and cultures and things like that. Uh, much easier to control that way. In this alternate timeline, Europe is transformed into a new age. In this age, a generation of Europeans are born into a society which encourages violence, lack of individuality, and glory to the state. The thinkers of the Enlightenment and French Revolution are despised, and literature from classical liberal thinkers have been destroyed. As more are born into this world, the easier it becomes to maintain the myth of Adolf Hitler. Any form of political opinion simply branches off as a form of Nazism, an entire alternate world of political thought, based on the progression of the Aryan race. Europeans are taught of the ominous force across the Atlantic, an enemy just like the Jews and Communists, the United States. Tune in for part three, which I guarantee will not take two weeks to make. Yeah, so I totally agree with him, and, and I mentioned at the top of this video, uh, you know, there's got to be an enemy, and I can see the Americans becoming that next big enemy, so I'll be really curious to see where he goes with that. Um, I agree with quite a bit of what he said there, agreed with a lot in the first episode. Some things I, I take issue with here, I just don't feel like it would have been quite as militaristic in peacetime. Uh, but I can see that scenario and I can understand where he's coming from with that. But let me know your thoughts. Use the comment section below. Hit that like button if you would. Make sure you check out the original content creator. We'll see you again tomorrow with the next episode. Thanks for watching.